So now if we think about school and school issues, um, I, a quote I think I've already shown in one of the other modules from me, just making the point that children with charge syndrome are truly multi-sensory impaired. And then another quote from me where I say most people with charge I've met satisfy the criteria for being considered as having deaf blindness, even if they have some useful vision and hearing. Deaf blindness is a disability that is defined in functional, not clinical terms. And for each individual with charge, it's mostly about difficulties in accessing information, not just from the world around them, but even from their own bodies. So even if your child with charge has quite a lot of useful vision or with hearing aids is picking up an awful lot of sound, I think thinking of them as multi-sensory impaired is a useful way of approaching the educational program. And I think far from being separate and different from mainstream education, good quality deafblind educational practice in assessment, in instruction, and in evaluating the program offers significant lessons to all students and all educators. Someone like me can go into a mainstream setting and be very helpful to the staff there, even if they have no or only very minimal special education training. Um, it, it really is a, an invaluable way of looking at children and thinking about children. But my next quote comes from my article about educational issues. I say a good and effective educational program, while being very positive and having high expectations, should always take account of the fact that everything that a child with charge syndrome does is likely to take more thought and attention and concentration and energy and time for them than it does for us. I'm coming back to the why are children with charge so lazy question. It shows a gross misunderstanding of the syndrome and what these children are having to deal with. So uh, although nobody could be more upbeat and positive about the children than me, equally no good nobody could be more finger wagging and saying to people remember you need to get this right for that child and that means allowing time allowing space clarifying things clarifying information in order to make it as easy as possible for the child to access the information and work out what to do with it and then respond in some way. I've coped by making three slides from a very experienced older teacher of children with deaf blindness who works at Perkins School for the Blind in Massachusetts here in the United States. Her name is Martha Majors and uh, she has written quite a number of pieces uh, about her approach to deafblind education. The first slide shows her idea of educational priorities. And I think it's interesting because if you go outside the deafblind field and you ask teachers to list their educational priorities, I think you would get a very different list than Martha's. And what Martha picks out as the main priorities, developing skills to become an effective communicator learning how to make choices, learning appropriate social skills. If you know charge syndrome, you can read between the lines of Martha's priorities and understand why she is emphasizing these things as being really important uh, topics to address right from the beginning. Learn to be part of a social and learning group developing the skill of negotiation, learn how to take turns, develop organizational skills in all environments, 
develop strategies for coping with challenges such as anxiety and obsessive compulsive routines, and developing the ability to anticipate activities and wait for them appropriately. And as I said, if you're familiar with charge, even in just one child, you can probably already understand why somebody like Martha would emphasize those things rather than the more typical list of priorities, which often would include quite a lot of academic goals. And you can see Martha doesn't specifically include purely academic goals. They're embedded in what she says in her list, but they're not emphasized as the priority. She's thinking on a much broader way of the whole child. The next slide from Martha shows her idea of teaching strategies, those tricks of the trade for teachers and classroom assistants uh, that can be uh, particularly helpful, but also in many cases are fairly essential to, to build the relationship and to get the child's education moving in the right direction. Um, she suggests that you introduce a, lots of choice making, starting with it very simple and very supported and then making it more complex. Uh, uh, providing a clear sequence to activities so the child knows exactly where they, where they are and what's required of them. Using a partial participation so that you do a lot of an activity and you know the places where you can ask the child to do their bit. Um, of, of the activity, uh, using the child's motivators, following the child's lead so that you're very much supporting them rather than just showing them all the time uh, what to do, uh, respecting and using the student's preferences, modeling activities, uh, using negotiation and empowerment, particularly if there's the risk of any kind of dispute or major meltdown type uh, situation, using appropriate prompts and knowing when to exaggerate prompts and, and when to fade them out of the picture, uh, using appropriate pause time, using task analysis, practicing sharing and turn taking, expressing clear expectations and providing access to appropriate communication modes. Uh, which should be a pretty obvious one. And then the third slide from Martha, optimal learning environments, and I'll talk a bit more about these later uh, myself. Um, a consistent place for the child's daily calendar. So they have a very, very reliable, predictable way of checking what they're going to be doing, what they are doing, what they have done. So they've got that whole picture. Uh, at any moment through the day. A safe space for relaxation and sensory reorganization, an area with reduced distractions, adapted furniture and lighting, visual and auditory accommodations for the, for the student, alternating active and passive sessions in the day, alternating preferred and less preferred activities, monitor fatigue issues very carefully, uh, consistency in the environment and the schedule, but the ability to be flexible when necessary, that can be quite a hard one to uh, work on with a student with charge. They tend to like high levels of predictability and familiar routines. And there's often a very disproportionately emotional response when things have to change suddenly and unexpectedly. So that has to be, that might have to be introduced artificially in order to get, give the child some experience of that coping with that sudden change experience. Um, physical environment plan to support attention and staff to be aware of signals of behavior. Learning to read the child to know when they're getting stressed or when they're getting bored and when they've had enough and when they might need some some movement or some time getting horizontal or a, just a change of, of activity or whatever. Then I have my next slide. Do not work at the limits of the child's vision and hearing 
abilities. Children with charge, we like to say, are very good at fooling people. They are so goal oriented. They are so keen to push, to do things and to achieve things. They can find strategies that help them given the difficulties they're dealing with. And sometimes they make things look easy that actually are not that easy. Things where they're having to put quite a lot of thought and energy into what they're doing, even though it doesn't obviously show to the untrained eye watching them. And um, that's why I made the point earlier about everything they do, taking more time, more attention, more energy for them than it does for us. And uh, I think they, they often learn to use their vision and their hearing remarkably well, but they may well be functioning at the threshold of what they can hear and what they can see. And it's important to accommodate that by making things easier than having them just at their threat. There's a big tendency, if people know that a child can hear speech at this particular volume, that's the volume they pitch their speech at, where they actually need to pitch their speech at a slightly higher volume, make it a little louder to make it easier for the child. Equally with vision, if they're told that maybe with glasses or contact lenses in, or maybe without aids, they can see a font that's a particular size. People are inclined to put everything in that font, where actually it should, they should make the font just a, quite a bit bigger to make it easier for the child. Just because the child can hear at that level or can see that size of font doesn't mean that's where they should be. Where none of us reads font just at the level we can about distinguish it for legibility. Equally, none of us has the radio on so that we can just hear what people are saying uh, over the air. We like it louder and we need to remember that with the children. And it's good to remember that children may well be fooling us and stuff might be more challenging and more difficult than it looks for them. Then move on to health issues. And as uh, I keep saying, there are very complex health issues in charge syndrome and they, to a large extent, can determine the child's availability for learning or otherwise. Nothing to do with the child's laziness or being difficult or naughty. And sometimes these things might not be obvious to us, but they're operating on powerful levels for the child. Many children their educational placement will depend on the availability of medical services or at least paramedical services. I know a number of children in California at the moment who go to school with a full-time nurse. Some of them also have a full-time intervener or classroom assistant. That presents huge management issues, but the fact is both those professionals are needed in order to help the child get through the school day successfully and safely and be learning um, at the same time. There's often a, a challenge of balancing health and educational needs and trying to work out how best can we build education in. And I think um, it is possible, something I've done quite often, is helping people make healthcare educational. So getting the child more actively involved in their own um, health care, getting children involved in tube feeding at an appropriate level, uh, getting children aware of what needs to be done and how they can prepare themselves in terms of undressing or pulling up their T-shirt or, or laying down or whatever is needed. And then also the early vocabulary uh, this is a group of children whose early vocabulary might need to include tube feed, suction machine, oxygen, um, nurse, doctor, along with other more familiar early childhood kind of uh, vocabulary that people would be more familiar with. And then just to back up some of a couple of uh, Martha Major's points, Calendar systems. This is a, an idea that comes very much from the dead 
deafblind field. There's lots of information online. Uh, if you go to the uh, National Center on Deaf Blindness, NCDB, there's a huge amount of information there. And if you search for calendar systems, you'll find all kinds of articles and videos to help you work out what they are and how they work. And then another thing Martha mentioned, individual workstations. Children with charge often need specialized equipment. They often need a special chair, a special desk or table. They might be highly distractible, so they might need something at the side of a room with a screen around it so that at times when they're doing fairly intensive tabletop work, they can go with a member of staff, maybe with their own intervener, and they can go to that workstation where they can be given the right physical supports, they can use the right physical postures to really maximize their functioning and maximize their comfort and their physical security, and also um, not be distracted by visual or auditory distractions, which otherwise, especially in a busy classroom or in a mainstream classroom, can cause anxieties. Um, often there's resistance to this idea because people want inclusion for the child and they're seeing a workstation as some kind of segregation. So we need to explain to people very carefully why this is needed for particular reasons at particular times. And we're not suggesting that that child is over in the corner behind a screen for the best part of ev every day. And then, as I've also mentioned, physical positioning of the child and physical supports. This is a bit of a mantra for me, getting this right. Children with charge often can't do lots of things, can't see properly, can't hear properly, can't use their hands and visually direct their hands if they're in the wrong physical position and they need to be in the right position to free up their brain. I talk about this a lot in the module about the proprioceptive and vestibular senses. And um, a few random examples I have of uh, adapted chairs that might be helpful. We've known some children with charge who do better standing at a high table than sitting. That's counterintuitive because we think, oh, vestibular issues, low tone, these children get fatigued, they need to be sitting, they need to be horizontal. But actually, sometimes standing improves their arousal level, it gives the brain better contact with the body, and the children function better. Sometimes, as in this picture, the children might need to be uh, very flexed, and that might be the best way of functioning. And then I've got two pictures of a very simple angled desktop, which can be helpful to bring table work up more into the child's line of vision. Um, if you've got charge and you've got low tone and vestibular issues, leaning your head forward and bringing your face down to look at work on the tabletop can really upset your equilibrium and your physical posture. An angled desktop brings things up more into your line of vision so that you can keep your head better balanced on top of your spine. And I've seen a simple angled desktop make an enormous difference to the child's ability to concentrate and attend and work successfully. And then another thing Martha mentioned, safe places for rest and reorganization of the body. Um, children might need to literally rest, to lay down. They might need to actually move. For some children, rest period means run, spinning on the spot or running around the schoolyard. Whatever works for the child to get their whole body, their whole sensory systems reorganized so they come back to the, to the actual formal teaching situation in a better place to attend, to concentrate, to respond and to participate with what's being taught. Um, here you see a young man taking his uh, reorganization period by 
uh, standing on his head upside down on the back of a couch and he's got a nice chewy in his mouth to get some really deep pressure in through his teeth and his jaw and again a reminder from my other module that deep pressure tends to be a very calming and reorganizing sensory input and then a picture of some of the many uh, chewies that are now available on the market they used to be fairly stigmatizing now they come designed to look like rather nice pieces of jewelry and here you see a selection of silicon chewies that can be worn around the neck um, and used by the children <laughs>